Section three of the two paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The two paths by John Ruskin. Section three, lecture one. The deteriorative power of conventional art over nations. Part three. I shall not trace from this embryo the progress of Gothic art in Italy, because it is much complicated and involved with traditions of other schools, and because most of the students will be less familiar with its results than with their own northern buildings. So, these two designs indicating death and life in the beginnings of medieval art, we will take an example of the progress of that art from our northern work. Now many of you doubtless have been interested by the mass, grandeur, and gloom of Norman architecture, as much as by Gothic traceries. And when you hear me say that the root of all good work lies in natural facts, you doubtless think instantly of your round arches with their rude cushion capitals, and of the billet or zigzag work by which they are surrounded. And you cannot see what the knowledge of nature has to do with either the simple plan or the rude mouldings. But all those simple conditions of Norman art are merely the expiring of it towards the extreme north. Do not study Norman architecture in Northumberland, but in Normandy, and then you will find that it is just a peculiarly manly and practically useful form of the whole great French school of rounded architecture. And where has that French school its origin? Holy in the rich conditions of sculpture, which, rising first out of imitations of the Roman bas-reliefs, covered all the façades of the French early churches with one continuous arabesque of floral or animal life. If you want to study round-arched buildings, do not go to Durham, but go to Poitiers, and there you will see how all the simple decorations which give you so much pleasure even in their isolated application were invented by persons practiced in carving men, monsters, wild animals, birds, and flowers, in overwhelming redundance. And then trace this architecture forward in central France, and you will find it loses nothing of its richness. It only gains in truth, and therefore in grace, until just at the moment of transition into the pointed style, you have the consummate type of the sculpture of the school given you in the west front of the cathedral of Chartres, from that front I have chosen two fragments to illustrate it. Footnote. This part of the lecture was illustrated by two drawings, made admirably by Mr. J. T. Leng, with the help of photographs from statues at Chartres. The drawings may be seen at present at the Kensington Museum, but any large photograph of the west front of Chartres will enable the reader to follow what is stated in the lecture as far as is needful. End footnote. These statues have been long and justly considered as representative of the highest skill of the twelfth or earliest part of the thirteenth century in France, and they indeed possess a dignity and delicate charm, which are for the most part wanting in later works. It is owing partly to real nobleness of feature, but chiefly to the grace, mingled with severity, of the falling lines of excessively thin drapery, as well as to a most studied finish in composition, every part of the ornamentation tenderly harmonizing with the rest. So far as their power over certain tones of religious mind is owing to a palpable degree of non-naturalism in them, I do not praise it. The exaggerated thinness of body and stiffness of attitude are faults, but they are noble faults, and give the statues a strange look of forming part of the very building itself and sustaining it, not like the Greek caryatid, without effort, nor like the Renaissance caryatid, by painful or impossible effort, but as if all that was silent and stern, and withdrawn apart, and stiffened and chill of heart against the terror of earth, had passed into a shape of eternal marble, and thus the ghost had given to bear up the pillars of the church on earth all the patient and expectant nature that it needed no more in heaven. This is the transcendental view of the meaning of those sculptures. I do not dwell upon it. What I do lean upon is their purely naturalistic and vital power. They are all portraits, 
unknown most of them, I believe, but palpably and unmistakably portraits, if not taken from the actual person for whom the statue stands, at all events studied from some living person whose features might fairly represent those of the king or saint intended. Several of them I suppose to be authentic. There is one of a queen who has evidently, while she lived, been notable for her bright black eyes. The sculptor has cut the iris deep into the stone, and her dark eyes are still suggested with her smile. There is another thing I wish you to notice specially in these statues. The way in which the floral moulding is associated with the vertical lines of the figure. You have thus the utmost complexity and richness of curvature set side by side with the pure and delicate parallel lines, and both the characters gain in interest and beauty. But there is deeper significance in the thing than that of mere effect in composition, significance not intended on the part of the sculptor, but all the more valuable because unintentional. I mean the close association of the beauty of lower nature in animals and flowers with the beauty of higher nature in human form. You never get this in Greek work. Greek statues are always isolated, blank fields of stone or depths of shadow, relieving the form of the statue as the world of lower nature which they despised retired in darkness from their hearts. Here, the clothed figure seems the type of the Christian spirit, in many respects feebler and more contracted, but pure, clothed in its white robes and crown, and with the riches of all creation at its side. The next step in the change will be set before you in a moment, merely by comparing this statue from the west front of Chartres with that of the Madonna, from the south transept door of Amiens. Footnote. There are many photographs of this door, and of its central statue. Its sculpture in the tympanum is farther described in the fourth lecture. End footnote. This Madonna, with the sculpture around her, represents the culminating power of Gothic art in the 13th century. Sculpture has been gaining continually in the interval, gaining simply because becoming every day more truthful, more tender, and more suggestive. By the way, the old Douglas motto, tender and true, may wisely be taken up again by all of us, for our own, in art no less than in other things. Depend upon it, the first universal characteristic of all great art is tenderness, as the second is truth. I find this more and more every day. An infinitude of tenderness is the chief gift and inheritance of all the truly great men. It is sure to involve a relative intensity of disdain towards base things, and an appearance of sternness and arrogance in the eyes of all hard, stupid, and vulgar people. Quite terrific to such if they are capable of terror, and hateful to them if they are capable of nothing higher than hatred. Dante's is the great type of this class of mind. I say the first inheritance is tenderness, the second truth, because the tenderness is in the make of the creature, the truth in his acquired habits and knowledge. Besides, the love comes first in dignity as well as in time, and that is always pure and complete, the truth at best imperfect. To come back to our statue, you will observe that the arrangement of this sculpture is exactly the same as at Chartres, severe falling drapery set off by rich floral ornament at the side, but the statue is now completely animated. It is no longer fixed as an upright pillar, but bends aside out of its niche and the floral ornament, instead of being a conventional wreath, is of exquisitely arranged hawthorn. The work, however, as a whole, though perfectly characteristic of the advance of the age in style and purpose, is in some subtler qualities inferior to that of Chartres. The individual sculptor, though trained in a more advanced school, has been himself a man of inferior order of mind compared to the one who worked at Chartres but I have not time to point out to you the subtler characters by which I know this. This statue then marks the culminating point of Gothic art, because up to this time the eyes of its designers had been steadily fixed on natural truth. They had been advancing from flower to flower, from form to form, from face to face, gaining perpetually in knowledge and veracity, therefore perpetually in power and in grace. But at this point a fatal change came over their aim. 
from the statue they now began to turn the attention chiefly to the niche of the statue and from the floral ornament to the mouldings that enclosed the floral ornament the first result of this was however though not the grandest yet the most finished of northern genius you have in the earlier gothic less wonderful construction less careful masonry far less expression of harmony of parts in the balance of the building earlier work always has more or less of the character of a good solid wall with irregular holes in it well carved wherever there is room but the last phase of good gothic has no room to spare it rises as high as it can on narrowest foundation stands in perfect strength with the least possible substance in its bars connects niche with niche and line with line in an exquisite harmony from which no stone can be removed and to which you can add not a pinnacle and yet introduces in rich though now more calculated profusion the living element of its sculpture sculpture in the quatrefoils sculpture in the brackets sculpture in the gargoyles sculpture in the niches sculpture in the ridges and hollows of its mouldings not a shadow without meaning and not a light without life footnote the two transepts of rouen cathedral illustrate this style there are plenty of photographs of them i take this opportunity of repeating what i have several times before stated for the sake of travellers that saint rouen impressive as it is is entirely inferior to the transepts of rouen cathedral End footnote. but with this very perfection of his work came the unhappy pride of the builder in what he had done as long as he had been merely raising clumsy walls and carving them like a child in waywardness of fancy his delight was in the things he thought of as he carved but when he had once reached this pitch of constructive science he began to think only how cleverly he could put the stones together the question was not now with him what can i represent but how high can i build how wonderfully can i hang this arch in air or weave this tracery across the clouds and the catastrophe was instant and irrevocable architecture became in france a mere web of waving lines in england a mere grating of perpendicular ones redundance was substituted for invention and geometry for passion though gothic art became a mere expression of wanton expenditure and vulgar mathematics and was swept away as it then deserved to be swept away by severer pride and purer learning of the schools founded on classical traditions you cannot now fail to see how throughout the history of this wonderful art from its earliest dawn in lombardy to its last catastrophe in france and england sculpture found on love of nature was the talisman of its existence wherever sculpture was practised architecture arose wherever that was neglected architecture expired and believe me all you students who love this medieval art there is no hope of your ever doing anything good with it but on this everlasting principle your patriotic associations with it are of no use your romantic associations with it either of chivalry or religion are of no use they are worse than useless they are false gothic is not an art for knights and nobles it is an art for the people it is not an art for churches or sanctuaries it is an art for houses and homes it is not an art for england only but an art for the world above all it is not an art of form or tradition only but an art of vital practice and perpetual renewal and whosoever pleads for it as an ancient or a formal thing and tries to teach it you as an ecclesiastical tradition or a geometrical science knows nothing of its essence less than nothing of its power leave therefore boldly though not irreverently mysticism and symbolism on the one side cast away with utter scorn geometry and legalism on the other seize hold of god's hand and look full in the face of his creation and there is nothing he will not enable you to achieve thus then you will find and the more profound and accurate your knowledge of the history of art the more assuredly you will find that the living power in all the real schools be they great or small is love of nature but do not mistake me by supposing that i mean this law to be all that is necessary to form a school there needs to be much superadded to it though there never must be anything superseding it the main thing which needs to be superadded 
is the gift of design. It is always dangerous and liable to diminish the clearness of impression to go over much ground in the course of one lecture. But I dare not present you with a maimed view of this important subject. I dare not put off to another time, when the same persons would not be again assembled, the statement of the great collateral necessity which, as well as the necessity of truth, governs all noble art. That collateral necessity is the visible operation of human intellect in the presentation of truth. The evidence of what is properly called design or plan in the work, no less than of veracity. A looking-glass does not design. It receives and communicates indiscriminately all that passes before it. A painter designs when he chooses some things, refuses others, and arranges all. This selection and arrangement must have influence over everything that the art is concerned with, great or small, over lines, over colors, and over ideas. Given a certain group of colors, by adding another color at the side of them, you will either improve the group and render it more delightful, or injure it and render it discordant and unintelligible. Design is the choosing and placing the color so as to help and enhance all the other colors it is set beside. So of thoughts. In a good composition, every idea is presented in just that order, and with just that force, which will perfectly connect it with all the other thoughts in the work, and will illustrate the others as well as receive illustration from them, so that the entire chain of thoughts offered to the beholder's mind shall be received by him with as much delight and with as little effort as is possible. And thus you see design, properly so called, is human invention, consulting human capacity. Out of the infinite heap of things around us in the world, it chooses a certain number which it can thoroughly grasp, and presents this group to the spectator in the form best calculated to enable him to grasp it also, and to grasp it with delight. And accordingly, the capacities of both gatherer and receiver being limited, the object is to make everything that you offer helpful and precious. If you give one grain of weight too much, so as to increase fatigue without profit, or bulk without value, that added grain is hurtful. If you put one spot or one syllable out of its proper place, that spot or syllable will be destructive. How far destructive, it is almost impossible to tell. A misplaced touch may sometimes annihilate the labor of hours nor are any of us prepared to understand the work of any great master till we feel this, and feel it as distinctly as we do the value of arrangement in the notes of music. Take any noble musical air, and you find, on examining it, that not one, even of the faintest or shortest notes, can be removed without destruction to the whole passage in which it occurs, and that every note in the passage is twenty times more beautiful so introduced than it would have been if played singly on the instrument. Precisely this degree of arrangement and relation must exist between every touch. Footnote. Literally. I know how exaggerated this statement sounds, but I mean it. Every syllable of it. See Appendix 4. End footnote. And line in a great picture. You may consider the whole as a prolonged musical composition, its parts as separate airs connected in the story, its little bits and fragments of color and line as separate passages or bars in melodies, and down to the minutest note of the whole, down to the minutest touch. If there is one that can be spared, that one is doing mischief. Remember, therefore, always, you have two characters in which all greatness of art consists. First, the earnest and intense seizing of natural facts, then the ordering those facts by strength of human intellect, so as to make them, for all who look upon them, to the utmost serviceable, memorable, and beautiful. And thus great art is nothing else than the type of strong and noble life, for as the ignoble person in his dealings with all that occurs in the world about him first sees nothing clearly, looks nothing fairly in the face, and then allows himself to be swept away by the trampling torrent, an unescapable force of the things that he would not foresee and could not understand. So the noble person, 
looking the facts of the world full in the face and fathoming them with deep faculty then deals with them in unalarmed intelligence and unhurried strength and becomes with his human intellect and will no unconscious nor insignificant agent in consummating their good and restraining their evil thus in human life you have the two fields of rightful toil for ever distinguished yet for ever associated truth first plan or design founded thereon so in art you have the same two fields for ever distinguished for ever associated truth first plan or design founded thereon now hitherto there is not the least difficulty in the subject none of you can look for a moment at any great sculptor or painter without seeing the full bearing of these principles but a difficulty arises when you come to examine the art of a lower order concerned with furniture and manufacture for in that art the element of design enters without apparently the element of truth you have often to obtain beauty and display invention without direct representation of nature yet respecting all these things also the principle is perfectly simple if the designer of furniture of cups and vases of dress patterns and the like exercises himself continually in the imitation of natural form in some leading division of his work then holding by this stem of life he may pass down into all kinds of merely geometrical or formal design with perfect safety and with noble results footnote this principle here cursorily stated is one of the chief subjects of inquiry in the following lectures End note thus giotto being primarily a figure painter and sculptor is secondarily the richest of all designers in mere mosaic of colored bars and triangles thus benvenuto cellini being in all the higher branches of metalwork a perfect imitator of nature is in all its lower branches the best designer of curve for lips of cups and handles of vases thus holbein exercised primarily in the noble art of truthful portraiture becomes secondarily the most exquisite designer of embroideries of robe and blazonries on wall and thus michelangelo exercised primarily in the drawing of body and limb distributes in the mightiest masses the order of his pillars and in the loftiest shadow the hollows of his dome but once quit hold of this living stem and set yourself to the designing of ornamentation either in the ignorant play of your own heartless fancy as the indian does or according to received application of heartless laws as the modern european does and there is but one word for you death death of every healthy faculty and of every noble intelligence incapacity of understanding one great work that man has ever done or of doing anything that it shall be helpful for him to behold you have cut yourselves off voluntarily presumptuously insolently from the whole teaching of your maker in his universe you have cut yourself off from it not because you were forced to mechanical labor for your bread not because your fate had appointed you to wear away your life in walled chambers or dig your life out of dusty furrows but when your whole profession your whole occupation all the necessities and chances of your existence led you straight to the feet of the great teacher and thrust you into the treasury of his works where you have nothing to do but to live by gazing and to grow by wondering willfully you bind up your eyes from the splendor willfully bind up your life-blood from its beating willfully turn your backs upon all the majesties of omnipotence willfully snatch your hands from all the aids of love and what can remain for you but helplessness and blindness except the worse fate than the being blind yourselves that of becoming leaders of the blind do not think that i am speaking under excited feeling or in any exaggerated terms i have written the words i use that i may know what i say and that you if you choose may see what i have said for indeed i have set before you to-night to the best of my power the sum and substance of the system of art to the promulgation of which i have devoted my life hitherto and i intend to devote what of life may still be spared to me 
I have had but one steady aim in all that I have ever tried to teach, namely, to declare that whatever was great in human art was the expression of man's delight in God's work. And at this time I have endeavoured to prove to you, if you investigate the subject you may more entirely prove to yourselves, that no school ever advanced far which had not the love of natural fact as a primal energy, but it is still more important for you to be assured that the conditions of life and death in the art of nations are also the conditions of life and death in your own, and that you have it, each in his power at this very instant, to determine in which direction his steps are turning. It seems almost a terrible thing to tell you, that all here have all the power of knowing at once what hope there is for them as artists. You would perhaps like better that there was some unremovable doubt about the chances of the future, some possibility you might be advancing in unconscious ways towards unexpected successes, some excuse or reason for going about, as students do so often, to this master or the other, asking him if they have genius, and whether they are doing right, and gathering from his careless or formal replies vague flashes of encouragement or fitfulnesses of despair. There is no need for this, no excuse for it. All of you have the trial of yourselves in your own power. Each may undergo at this instant, before his own judgment seat, the ordeal by fire. Ask yourselves, what is the leading motive which actuates you while you are at work? I do not ask you what your leading motive is for working. That is a different thing. You may have families to support, parents to help, brides to win. You may have all of these, or other such sacred and preeminent motives, to press the morning's labor and prompt the twilight thought. But when you are fairly at the work, what is the motive, then, which tells upon every touch of it? If it is the love of that which your work represents, if being a landscape painter, it is love of hills and trees that moves you, if being a figure painter, it is love of human beauty and human soul that moves you, if being a flower or animal painter, it is love and wonder and delight in petal and in limb that move you, then the spirit is upon you and the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. But if, on the other hand, it is petty self-complacency in your own skill, trust in precepts and laws, hope for academical or popular approbation or avarice of wealth, it is quite possible that by steady industry or even by fortunate chance you may win the applause, the position, the fortune that you desire, but one touch of true art you will never lay on canvas or on stone as long as you live. Make, then, your choice, boldly and consciously, for one way or other it must be made. On the dark and dangerous side are set the pride which delights in self-contemplation, the indolence which rests in unquestioned forms, the ignorance that despises what is fairest among God's creatures, and the dullness that denies what is marvellous in his working. There is a life of monotony for your own souls, and of misguiding for those of others. And, on the other side, is open to your choice the life of the crown spirit, moving as a light in creation, discovering always, illuminating always, gaining every hour in strength, yet bowed down every hour into deeper humility sure of being right in its aim sure of being irresistible in its progress happy in what it has securely done happier in what day by day it may securely hope happiest at the close of life when the right hand begins to forget its cunning to remember that there never was a touch of the chisel or the pencil it wielded but is added to the knowledge and quickened the happiness of mankind. End of section three. Recording by Todd Albrick.